Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 42. Today we'll talk about the latest numbers, pandemic math and conspiracy theories, and is it safe to travel? So uh, here we are in Nebraska surrounded by a sea of red and it's not Husker fans. It's basically states around us doing even worse than us. Uh, and so a lot of states uh, unfortunately have had those rates explode. Uh, we're actually not that far behind them. Uh, so the reason we've fallen down the rankings is not because we're doing better. It's because some of, so many of them are doing even worse than us. And so we're uh, getting close to that red line, but we're not quite there yet, but not near as bad as North and South Dakota and Wisconsin. So here in Nebraska, our trend unfortunately is up quite a bit. And so we're getting pretty close there. So unless something changes in the next uh, week or two, we will be there uh, just like the rest of them, unfortunately. Uh, it's not evenly spread around Nebraska, so actually out west uh, things aren't looking so bad actually. You have to be a little careful, like I say, on county level, because some rural counties, you know, this could be this is could be zero cases, this could be five cases, just because it's such a slow, low population base. Um, you know, our big problems, of course, I think northeast Nebraska is, worries me the most, as well as Lincoln, Lincoln, Lancaster County and surrounding areas. You've got, you know, University of Nebraska Kearney and uh, here that's a, a college town in North Platte. So those are the areas that are looking a little uh, dicey right now in Nebraska. If you go up north, I think you have to combine counties. So if you go to Norfolk area and add uh, the Norfolk and the surrounding counties, you see that they're very much in the red up there. Uh, things flop around in the small counties, like I said, just because it's small population base. But this is a problem because in this area, this is what it's sort of a watershed referral area. There are a lot of patients who get hospitalized might get sent up north to South Dakota. But as the South Dakota hospitals fill up, they're going to have to start sending some of those extra sick people down to Lincoln and Omaha. Well, we have supply down in Lincoln, Omaha to take in those people. At the same time, our rates are going up as well. So this is my biggest worry is could we, would we start exceeding hospital capacity in eastern Nebraska in the coming weeks? Um, I had a person ask me a while back, you know, why is it that it seems like states seem to get to this 500 per uh, million range and then they stop? Is it something natural that stops it? Uh, and actually, I'd say, no, it's not the virus itself that stops. It's uh, the herd. Most of these places didn't are nowhere close to herd immunity. The antibody studies showing that they're at most 10 to 20 percent. So there may be a third uh, or even only a fifth of the way there. I think what happens when you hit 500 per million is even the most boneheaded politician starts realizing we've got a problem and everybody around them finally knows somebody who got sick and now they believe it. Uh, and so what happens is when these uh, people get to this point, they take it seriously and they tend to push the rates down. Uh, this is Arizona and Florida, uh, although this is a diverging thing. Arizona is now one of the top 10 states as far as doing a good job of controlling it, although Florida is not. And their governor is already saying go back out to the restaurants and bars. So I think we may have one of the most boneheaded politicians in the country in Florida, for example. Uh, and now we have South Dakota, North Dakota, Wisconsin hitting that level as well. And I think this is going to be the point uh, where they're going to realize, uh-oh, we uh, took it, didn't take it seriously enough. In Nebraska, like I say, we're not that we're behind them, but uh, not that far. So hopefully, we can uh, not report repeat their mistakes here in Nebraska. Here in Lincoln, Lancaster County, uh, we were a little uh, cautiously optimistic because back here, a lot of these were college students, uh, and so our hope was this would be contained within the college population. And as that got contained, we'd see our numbers drop. Unfortunately, that has not happened. Uh, also, on top of that. If you look at the UNL COVID dashboard, of the 75 to 100 cases a day we're getting, only 14, at least on the dashboard, are, are from Lincoln, are from the, the college. So uh, this argues uh, that we did not keep it contained within the colleges that is spreading amongst the community. Uh, as a school board member, I hope we can at least keep it out of our schools. But it appears to be now that it is spreading out in the community, which is, of course, a big concern. Um, so the problem is, is that the people, you know, I, I, we haven't seen any cases, we haven't seen, and then suddenly one thing happens. And, and over and over again, it's something like a wedding, uh, a dance, uh, a bar, a crowded bar, a coffee shop. Uh, places inside where people are not wearing masks are just dangerous in a pandemic, and people just keep learning this over and over. So this is a famous main, uh, infamous uh, main wedding now, where there are already eight, eight deaths have been linked back to that one wedding. So hopefully that was a good wedding for them, but, but it wasn't really worth it to kill eight people. Uh, and this is what's happening over and over again. Uh, we have our own Lincoln ex example. We have the Lincoln Eagles Club dance September 11th. Uh, initially in the paper, they said they had 10 cases. Then I saw a few days ago, it was 16 cases and one hospitalization. And then yesterday, they're saying now four or five hospitalizations. The key here that, that 
keeps throwing off coronavirus is the lag time between infections to people being in the hospital to being dead. It takes a while. So what you'll see here is that the, all the dance was September 11th. Here, this was reported the 29th, 18 days later. It took 18 days to get to the point where it resulted in hospitalizations. And that's because there's you know a four, up to 14 day incubation phase. And then even when people get sick, it takes sometimes one to two weeks before they get to the point where they're sick enough to be in the hospital. And that's why there's that lag time. And we need to quit. We need politicians to quit looking at hospitalization rate as the main thing to follow because by the time your hospitals are full, it's too late. You should have acted a month ago. Uh, and so again, here we have at least two to four weeks. I think this may not be the full extent of this. And uh, hopefully they'll do a similar uh, track back, just like the main at wedding where we track how, many, how far that those uh, Lincoln Eagles Club dance members, uh, how many people they got sick and how many people in the hospital. And unfortunately, maybe even a few will die because of that one dance. So our all-county all rates, uh, like I say, my concern right now is our hospitalization rates as they go up, those are based on the infection rate we had down here, not what we have here. And as if this keeps going up, we, we do have a high likelihood of, of hitting our hospital capacity in the next month. So something needs to get done. People need to start taking this seriously. Uh, we need to quit going to places without masks and sitting inside for a long time. Just because you can get away with it at a bar or coffee shop, you should put your mask on. And like I keep telling people, I'll go into the coffee shop and order my coffee. I'm going to go sit outside. I'm not going to sit inside the coffee shop. Uh, and again, this is a perfect example of the Starbucks in Korea. We know that there's probably at least some aerosol spread. I can't imagine that this is all droplet spread to, that one person would infect 27 other people. Uh, again, the key thing, though, is the four employees who are wearing a mask didn't get affected. So wear a mask to, uh, even if you're stuck someplace like this. Uh, so what keeps happening over is people just don't understand pandemic math. It's not intuitive. Uh, it's just like compound interest can be uh, hard to understand. This is a quote by Albert Einstein. I think Warren Buffett was also quoted once as saying that compound interest is one of the greatest forces in the universe. And it's just because it's got this lag and it sneaks up on you. And so this is an uh, illustration of a famous uh, uh, proposal where someone has said, would you rather have a penny that doubles every month? every day for a month or would you have a million dollars and most people would say I'll take the million dollars but actually because of compound interest if that penny doubles every day for the course of a month by the when you hit day 27 or 28 it's actually worth far more than a million dollars and pandemics are the same way things kind of sit there and percolate under the surface and then all it takes is one wedding uh, one dance, one something like that, and suddenly uh, everything spreads out of control. Now, the, what we can, we can somewhat keep it under control because a lot of us are wearing masks now, so it won't be as steep a, a, an issue, but when you have 75 people without a mask at a dance, this is what happens. It also means, though, that before you start opening up again, you have to push it way down to these levels, not just down to this level, and I think this is the mistake that the Florida governor's made. He's gotten it just below the surface, and he's opening up way too prematurely. He needs to make sure he's like Arizona, where he's got to spread way down here before he thinks about opening up uh, more. So the other problem we have is we don't have a good monitoring system. So this article uh, was put out in CDC about uh, infections in school aid children. I think it was actually widely misquoted and, 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 and they were got a little off. Uh, the problem we're finding, and you have to unfortunately go to the discussion session to understand some of the limitations of the article because they call out the limitations in the article. If you go back, they say, first, these data might underestimate the actual incidence of disease among school children because testing was frequently prioritized for a person with symptoms, and asymptomatic infection in children is common. So we don't have good data in children because literally we haven't tested most of them, and we still haven't tested enough to know what's going on. So one of the, my biggest concerns from the school perspective is we don't have any surveillance testing ability right now. Uh, hopefully, we'll be getting that soon. Um, the good news, and uh, as a father of three, uh, my biggest worry is our, our kids safe. The good news is, for the most part, yes, there are some rare cases of kids getting hospitalized and having uh, an inflammatory system like compounds uh, Kawasaki, but it's really rare. So the good news is our young people are probably pretty healthy. The problem, though, is that they come home and they might spread it to parents and grandparents and things like this. Uh, this is a really great CDC visual. It pretty much encapsulates most of what you need to know. And so there are good things coming out of the CDC. So again, they, they use actually the Japanese one, avoid crowded si si uh, situation, enclosed spaces, close physical contact. This is exactly what Japan did. Uh, wear a mask, uh, keep your distancing. And of course, had Japan had way better testing, better leadership, and better con uh, contact tracing than we did. But it does show that, you know, unfortunately, as we get older, our risks go much, much, much higher. But at least our kids are mostly going to be safe from this. Um, hopefully we will get access to some uh, more rapid testing. Uh, this came out that, uh, so hopefully this will be available, but it goes to the states. Our, st our, so our state does have to do a good job of, of helping us out in our schools to, by doing some surveillance testing, hopefully the next few weeks. 
Uh, we still have a problem with testing in Nebraska. Uh, we have only one of our labs here in Lincoln. It has less than a 48-hour turnaround physician's lab. Uh, the rest are all above uh, 48 hours, and Test Nebraska got a little bit better, but now they're right back up to three days again, again, unfortunately. So let's talk about some conspiracies. I keep, uh, someone asked me, would you please talk about this, because I hear these over again. I've literally heard this uh, this uh, said a number of times, even when we were out in Colorado sitting around across the fire pit from a couple of someone, well, I heard about this guy who decided not to wait in line and got a positive test. Uh, to me, it's like one of these urban myths and legends. If, if you're my age, everybody was scared about that razor blade and apple uh, apple uh, for Halloween. Uh, although that urban myth and legend went around, there was actually never a single documented case where that had actually happened, but it just sort of spread as a rumor. Uh, actually, though, I think this may have happened, and it's not because it's something intentional is being done wrong. I think it's just simply an accident. Uh, we've actually had numerous cases of lost tests here in Nebraska, uh, here in Lincoln, where so chances are what happened is somebody got this mislabeled and got a positive. Uh, when you think about it, you know, there have been 103 million tests done in Nebraska. I doubt that all 103 million, there wasn't a mistake made somewhere. So there's probably been a few cases and maybe some people get an inaccurate result. Uh, hopefully it will, the, will do better over time. But that has nothing to do with whether this is a real epidemic or not. Uh, yes, there were some mistakes made, but that doesn't mean this is a hoax. Uh, the other thing that really annoys me is people say they were going to die anyway. Well, we're all going to die anyway at some point. It's just a question of when. And I'd rather not die today or in, uh, next week or next month if I've got 10 years of life expectancy. I want to wait 10 years. Uh, and so, yes, there are some people and older people in the nursing home who might have been close to death who got it, but there's a lot of people who weren't in, in a nursing home and weren't that close to death. There are people who, it might be your coworker who's 55 years old who has heart disease and diabetes. He had maybe 20 years left to go before he got coronavirus. So this, they were going to die today was wrong. And when did we start convening death panels anyway? I thought we were against that. Uh, the other one is that they didn't die of COVID, they died with COVID. Uh, that is actually just a, a sort of an illogical statement in, in many ways. It's kind of like what I would say. It'd be like saying that person with diabetes hit by a bus didn't die of a bus, bus accident. He died with a bus accident. No, the bus killed him. Uh, yes, he had diabetes. He's going to be less likely to survive a bus accident, but it was a bus accident that killed him. And so what happened with the death certificate uh, debacle with the 6%, that they completely misread the, the 6%. The fact that 6% did not have a comorbidity is actually scary to me, not reassuring, because that means 6% of the people dying of coronavirus didn't have any comorbidities. They were actually perfectly healthy and died of coronavirus. Now, we know that coronavirus is much worse than people with diabetes and obesity. So this is what a death certificate would look like. And, and this is actually what those look like. So yes, the, the leading diagnosis was respiratory failure, but that respiratory failure was due to pneumonia, and that pneumonia was due to coronavirus. Pneumonia is a, a coalition. It's a kind of disease caused by many things, one of which could be coronavirus, influenza, streptococcus, pneumonia. We want to, what we're looking here, and the reason this, a death certificate, a certificate is put in this way is we need to understand how people die of a disease like coronavirus or a bus accident. In coronavirus, the most common is, way is pneumonia and respiratory failure, but there are other causes. Sometimes it could be a heart attack. It could be a stroke. We want to capture that so we know how do people die of coronavirus because doctors and nurses need to know that so they can do a better job. Comorbidities will increase your chances of dying, but that doesn't mean you died of diabetes or died of obesity. It was coronavirus that killed you, but you were, your chances of survival were lower because of this. Just like if you're in a bus accident, by being, being diabetic or obese, your chances of survival are less, but it doesn't mean that that's what killed you. It was the bus accident that caused the head trauma that caused your brain hemorrhage. Same thing with this. Again, the other thing I've heard people say, but the death certificate said he died of pneumonia, not COVID. Well, COVID is a cause of pneumonia, and people are misunderstanding. There are many things that cause pneumonia. Right now, the predominant one is coronavirus. During a typical flu season, it could be influenza, but we're not having influenza right now. Uh, and so, again, the way that I've used before is the way this is sorted out is through uh, excess mortality. And so here is both Arizona, when they hit the point of, uh-oh, we better pay attention, as well as uh, Florida, although Florida I think is going to go back up again because DeSantis doesn't seem to be paying attention to learning lessons of the past, uh, while Arizona is learning their lessons and is now one of the better states in the country right now because they have put in mask ordinances and they are getting it under control. Uh, so again, it goes back to reliable sources. Make sure that when you're getting a source, just don't look at it. I mean, I've, I've had people keep saying, well, people keep saying different things. Well, that's because you're listening to people who have no, no credentials to understand the epidemic. So get your news sources from credible experts. Don't go to these, uh, don't look at these memes that people are sending out where th this is just so factually wrong. For example, saying that a tuberculosis is a virus, which it isn't. Uh, any kid with high school biology in a, in, in a Google search should be able to figure out why this one's wrong. So quit forwarding this stuff. Go to a reputable source. Uh, my most reputable source right now, I actually like the SIDREP co uh, uh, 
podcast out of University of Minnesota by Michael Osterholm. Uh, they're an hour long, so this, I listen to this. Uh, this is my weekly Mowing the Long podcast. Uh, he's very, very sharp, uh, good, honest uh, Midwesterner, very practical, pragmatic guy. So this is my go-to source. Uh, lastly, is it safe to travel? And so I actually think it is safe to travel if you know how to travel. As long as you do it correctly, I think you're good with this. Uh, and so I, I would go back to the silver buckshot. As long as you're doing things like wearing a mask, staying outside, keeping your distance, washing your hands, and avoiding gatherings, you can be fine to travel. So you just got to learn how to travel. Uh, so my wife and I, we've actually done multiple road trips this summer. We've been to Wyoming, Montana, Colorado. Uh, and if you're outside, the, the risk in any of these places, these three situations is zero from grenade coronavirus because it doesn't float around outside like this. And there's our dog Maggie, of course. The, the biggest challenge is finding a place to stay. And I think if you find a motel, wear a mask, uh, they, I think they do a good enough job cleaning. We're not seeing as much fomite spread as we thought. The big thing is still droplet spread primarily with some aerosol spread. That's why you need to eat outside. And so our biggest challenge is finding enough places outside to eat. But usually if you just look around, you can find some place like this uh, restaurant in Dornel, Del Norte, Colorado we went to. Uh, so I'm actually planning on another trip, probably going to take a road trip with my dad to uh, Utah next month. Uh, again, if you know how to travel, I think you can be safe. Um, and even airline travel. Uh, actually, there are, I think there actually are enough air changes in a plane that if you're wear, uh, an airline that's very uh, good about enforcing masks, uh, so like, for example, uh, Delta and Southwest, if you've got an empty middle seat and everybody's going to wear a mask, I actually think it's okay to get on a plane again. So I'm going to start looking for uh, one of those cheap flights to, uh, from Omaha to Phoenix and uh, Phoenix because Arizona is doing a good job. So maybe in November or December we'll go, we'll go down to, to Phoenix for a three-day weekend if we find a cheap flight. I'm okay with that, actually. So hopefully this is okay. Uh, again, disclaimer, this is my opinion. It's not necessarily all these people I work with and for, but here they are. And if you want to look at the past episodes, they're on our healthylincoln.org website.